Hello and welcome, welcome everyone to Wisdom of the Mystics. And what a great wonder and honor it is to be here with you all today. As we come here twice a month and we get to deepen into the mystical roots of our teachings of new thought, knowing that every time we learn about yet another mystic, that it really touches our lives and allows us to live our lives in a more awakened and enlightened way. And so I'm Reverend Kathy Mastriani, Executive Director of the Science of Mind Archives and Library Foundation. And it's just a joy and honor to be with you today. And we get to learn about yet another new mystic. And again, I'm with the Science Mind Archives, which we're really here to preserve protect and present science of mind wisdom and philosophy for all of us. Our website, sciencemindarchives.com is just so, uh, it's just a great place to learn more. And so I'm honored here. I'm going to let my beautiful, lovely co-host, uh, Laura Topper, introduce herself a little bit more. And she's going to introduce our super guest and our mystic. So thank you, Laura. Oh, thank you, Reverend Kath. It's so great to be here again this week. It's amazing how two weeks just is that it goes so quickly. And it's always yes. really exciting. Uh, looking forward to the, the new guest that's coming on and the, the presentation of our, our mystic each and every week. And here we are at the end of June feeling, wow, this is such a blessing. All of the great uh, presenters that have been on the show here on New Thought Media Network. And today's guest, well, I'm, I'm just feeling really humbled and grateful and blessed that Reverend Mark Gilbert is here backstage um, waiting to come on, which he will do in a moment, to come and share his knowledge and wisdom of William Walker Atkinson. And I know that Reverend Mark has an incredible blog, which is really more of an educational experience. Every week, uh, Reverend Mark creates um, uh, writings about teachers, new thought, science of mind, teachings as well, and focuses in on certain mystics. And so when I, um, when I put this idea forward to Reverend Mark for, for coming on. And he said, ah, oh, I know who I'd like to present. And later he said, no, actually I've changed my mind. I really know who I would like to present. And Reverend Mark does such great work in the world as a as, as Center for Spiritual Living Minister. And of course, uh, he was uh, chair, chair or director of the Global Services Committee for a while. And I was kind of crossing over. I was there with him as well, which was great to be there in the beginning with Reverend Mark for me. And Reverend Mark, I know, is a leader on the Leadership Council of the Science of Mind Archives. So his knowledge is absolutely tapped into in so many ways in our spiritual community as he shares his wisdom with the world. So I'm going to bring you on right now from Mark Gilbert. Thank you so much for being here today and for sharing and shining the light on this incredible mystic that I know you've really delved into and have researched in many ways. Thank you. Well, thank you. Thank you, Laura, for the beautiful introduction. And uh, thank you, Kathy, as well. And it's good to see my good friends uh, here today. And, uh, and also uh, good to come with you and, and share about William Walker Atkinson, whom I think a lot of new thought and uh, people are not aware of or don't know much about. And so uh, I'm excited that we, we might be introducing someone new to a lot of people today. Oh, that's good. That's what we like. <laughs> Bring in the new awareness. Yeah, I will say this. You were talking about when you first contacted me, and I, I originally was thinking about uh, Christian D. Larson. I wrote a, an article for uh, Science of Mind magazine a number of years ago by Christian D. Larson. And as part of the research on that, I had, uh, there's, there's a long story I could go into. And maybe I'll do that in a, in a future one. Maybe if we do Larson in the, in the future, I would, I'd love to come back and talk about him. Uh, because there's actually a lot of similarities between Larson and um, and Atkinson, whom we're discussing today. But I know that when we, we talk about the wisdom of the mystics and new thought, you know, there's all the common people that we, if you're, if you're in new thought, you hear about, oh, 
you know, Emerson or, or uh, Judge Troward or Emma Curtis Hopkins or, you know, Phineas Quimby. There's the key people who are key essence of, of teachers and, and key touchstones for the changes that brought about and, and led to the philosophy of new thought that we always go back to. But there are so many other people out there, especially the late 1800s and early 1900s. There was a really broad uh, number of folks who served as a conduit for bringing together all of these various uh, aspects of mental science into the into the philosophy we call new thought these days, and none more so than the guy we're going to be talking about today, William William Walker Atkinson, whom I got to confess, I really wasn't that aware of who he was until uh, late last year. Um, you know, I think he just sort of like skated by my awareness. And the I'll, I'll simply say this as a sort of a precursor to getting into talking about him, is that I was going through a uh, a, a an a organization of all these books behind me. My wife and I've got, I don't know, way too many books, 2,000, 500, something like that. And I was, uh, we had done some renovating and I had moved all the books out and all the books back and they were not in any order. So I decided to sit down and go through all my books and put them in like groupings by category. And I was also up, updating the database I've got with a, with a website called Library Thing where I was updating my data. And, um, and as part of all of that, I kept finding books I wanted to read. I go, Oh my God, I didn't know. I forgot I had that book. I forgot I had that book. And I think we've all had that experience of, of buying books and then and uh, and going, where the heck did that come from? I didn't even know it was on my shelves. And one that I, I discovered and pulled off as part of that was this one. It's called The Kabbalion uh, by William Walker Atkinson, writing his three initiates. And we'll talk about it later. But it was actually by discovering that book, it got into a stack of books that I said, I've got to start reading these books. And it wasn't the first one I got to. The first ones were some by um, Donald Curtis, who's a new thought uh, teacher of the mid 20th century. And but then I got to this book and I read it and went all the way through it. And I said, God, this was a good book. This, why did I not know about this book? You know, somehow or another, I bought it and then just stuck it on my shelf. You know, so there was some some synchronistic event that led me to, to getting it. And um, and the book was so wonderful that it's I rarely do this. I as soon as I finished reading it, I started over reading it again because it was that good. Wow. And it and it said so many things to me that made so much clarity that brought into wow. focus about science of mind. That since that time, I've been recommending mm -hmm. this book left and right to, to folks and right and and you know encouraging them them to read it. And what's what's interesting is it was published in 1908, and it's that old. And, but it speaks to where we are and who we are these days. And it helped clarify concepts of Ernest Holmes and science of mind and other things that I saw them in a new light just simply by reading that book. And the, the other interesting thing is as soon as I read it and I started going down, well, why did I not know about this book? I went off and started doing like quick research and come to find out it's, it's been having sort of a renaissance in the last uh, 10, 20 years. Um, I think because when it hit the 100 year anniversary, it had always been a popular book, but new editions came out, uh, not only uh, the one I was mentioning here, um, but there's another one called the, uh, that was the Centauri edition that's, that's come out. And they're both excellent uh, copies. So it's not a really thick book and it's very, uh, very great uh, in terms of its content and its voice. Um, but uh, that said, uh, not, so not only do I recommend reading that book, but it made me wonder who who is this guy, and so I start as I did this research. One of the first things I discovered is that uh, there were some videos out there by our good friend Mitch Horowitz. Mitch is, of course, a, a New Thought author in his own right, and uh, has published a New Thought uh, historian book called One Simple Idea. Um, and Mitch has some YouTube videos I discovered where he's talking about the Kabbalion and discovering it and having the same experience I had about reading it. You know, he sort of he sort of encountered it thought, eh, it's, it's crazy. He comes back and reads the whole thing and then reads it almost immediately in full and then starts doing videos and talks about it. And, and then recently uh, there was a movie that he and some other people put together all about the Kabbalion and the concepts in it. So that, that came out in the last year or so. And so all of this is like hitting at the same time, wow. these new editions of the book and people putting videos out. And so, you know, there's a, there's a lot there, but that brings us to who the heck wrote it and who is William Walker Atkinson. So, yeah. <laughs> yes. So, you want me to talk about that? Wow. Thank you so much. 
Thank you so much for 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 explaining that and the the journey of of how you are here now with the book. That's incredible that you found it. Yeah. Here you are with it. <laughs> I love yeah, it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'll tell you a little bit about who he is and just as a background. And um, yeah, you know, he was born in uh, 1862. Oh. He was in Baltimore, Maryland. He was a lawyer, and he. Uh, had an interest in the occult and studying uh, Eastern religions and things of that nature. He moved and because of a snafu in his move, they said, you've got to reapply for the bar. So he had a period of time where he didn't have uh, uh, his status as a lawyer. So he used his interest as in the occult and, and, and uh, mental sciences to start writing in the, in that area. He did eventually become get his bar license back and, and still was a practicing lawyer. But he also had, uh, because of the stresses of being a lawyer, he, he writes later in life about uh, the fact that those stresses uh, quest made him question the path he was on as being a lawyer and all the things that he was doing and having to do in terms of that and the illnesses that was bringing about. And so in that, he decided to practice some of the concepts of mental science and mental healing that he was reading and studying and discovered that they helped him through this crisis. So he then says he wants to learn more about these things that have helped him personally. And he starts studying new thought and, and other uh, esoteric uh, concepts. He obviously, uh, and, and I think one of the big questions is, is where does he, where did he get his information from? And uh, Mitch Horowitz in his book, One Simple Idea, uh, says that uh, Atkinson studied with Emma Curtis Hopkins, who we all know as one of the you know teacher of teachers, you know that she taught Ernest Holmes and she taught the Fillmores who started Unity and and she taught uh, many of the people who were influential in divine science and so many others, but um, you know apparently Atkinson uh, moved in moved to Chicago and did study with at a time with uh, Emma Curtis Hopkins. He also studied, according to Mitch, with a woman by the name of uh, of uh, Wilmans. I'm sorry, <clears throat> excuse me, just a second. He studied with Helen Wilmans. Helen is a famous early early New Thought writer who has an interesting story in her own right. She was a a, a, a housewife who followed her father, or her husband around ta uh, the country. He went out to the West in the gold rush and had some successes and failures. And long story short, she leaves her husband and, and, and goes and studies and becomes a New Thought teacher and, and has people who are, are writing into her for uh, correspondence lessons. And she ends up uh, starting this, the town of Seabreeze, Florida with her husband, where they publish and, and sell um, New Thought teachings. Uh, and because of a move of a post office, she has some bouts with the uh, uh, postal authorities in the United States, and they ended up temporarily shutting her down. But so she's she's this other New Thought teacher that was influential on uh, on, on Atkinson. And Atkinson also met and studied with a, uh, a one of the early Eastern uh, yogis who came to the U.S. His name was uh, Baba Bharati, and uh, Atkinson and he have are known to have had contacts and had a friendship. And in fact, uh, Atkinson wrote for a small time for Bharati's magazine called the The Light of India. But long story short, you got this guy who's a lawyer, legal mind, who can take stuff, complex ideas, and sort of boil them down into easy to understand chunks of ideas. He's got an occult interest, and through some life challenges, he sort of shifts from being a lawyer into being an occult teacher. And through that, he moves from, from uh, Baltimore into, into Pennsylvania, and then on into Chicago, and, and starts working for a guy uh, uh, as editing a, a magazine. Yeah, which uh, was called the Journal of Magnetism. And this was in the year 1901. He takes on the editorship of this thing, a guy by the name of Sidney Flower, another early uh, New Thought uh, proponent who had a lot of magazines that he published back in the eight, late 1800s, early 1900s. Atkinson becomes the editor for his magazine and, so, and encourages him to change the name to New Thought. <laughs> so uh, Atkinson starts writing New Thought articles. But, you know, the interesting side note is Atkinson's very first published article was in a magazine called um, Modern Thought, which is now known under the name of Unity. And it was published by Charles and, and Myrtle Fillmore. And, and the Fillmores published this magazine when it was back actually in uh, 19, I'm sorry, 1889, that Atkinson wrote an article called A Mental Science Catechism. 
that was published in Fillmore's magazine in 1889. Mm. But it's in 19, you jump forward to 1900. He moves to Chicago. He publishes his first book. It's called Thought Force in Business and Everyday Life. Obviously, he's interested in the power of thoughts and thought force. And then he becomes the editor of the mag, the Journal of Magnetism, which changes its name to New Thought. And, he, and he's the editor off and on for New Thought uh, magazine until 1910. And during his during his tenure, the magazine circulation grew from 4,500 to over 100,000 people. So in that brief time, just to show oh, the number of people wow. who, were, who were reading. And it was one of so many, many uh, New Thought uh, publications. Now, here's the the interesting thing is that Atkinson uh, often, uh, why do we not know about him? Well, there, there's two big reasons that we don't know so much about him. Is One is that he published a lot of his stuff under other names. Oh. And he also um, uh, didn't start an organization that he saw himself as a, a synthesizer and teacher and writer of um, mystical concepts. And he put them out in not only in his own magazine, but also wrote for other other people's magazines. I mentioned Baba Bahariti's uh, Science of India, uh, the Light of India magazine. Uh, Atkinson wrote for that, but he also wrote for uh, Elizabeth Town and her magazine Nautilus. Many of many people who studied early New Thought are probably familiar with the Nautilus magazine. It was one of the most famous uh, New Thought magazines. And and uh, during the period of uh, uh, probably you know of later in, in his uh, life from 2012 to 20, um, uh, 19, I'm sorry, 1912 to 1920, uh, Atkinson wrote not only for other magazines, but wrote for uh, Elizabeth Towns magazine as well. And then later he came back and edited a magazine called Advanced Thought uh, from 18, 1916 to 1922. So for many years, he was a magazine writer. But here's, here's the kind of the funny, cool thing is that Oftentimes, you'd look at the masthead of the magazine, and it would list a number of names of people. And it would look like it was a lot of different people. But a lot of those other people were pseudonyms of oh. Atkinson writing oh, wow. their name. And Ooh. the other... <laughs> well, I know, right? Yeah. Really? And one of his most famous ones uh, was a, a name called Yogi Ramachakaraka. And wow. Wow. Oh, oh, about um, 13 books. In oh, fact, can you hold that up a little bit closer, Reverend Mark, yeah, like to the screen? Science of breath. Oh, my goodness. Yeah. Science yeah. of oh breath. God. Wow. Yeah. He wrote, and he, wrote he named himself as Rogi Yama, Rama Chakara. Yeah, and, and they created this mythical backstory. About who <laughs> there you yeah. go. Thank you. Right. Rama Chakaraka. Rama Chakaraka. <laughs> And um, they created a backstory about just being an Indian uh, who had come to the U.S. or had had been this wise Indian and wanted to bring yogic traditions to the U.S. And uh, so people wonder, how did Atkinson learn what he knew about, uh, you know, yogi, uh, yogic traditions in Hinduism? Uh, there's there's a concern that maybe he might be learned it from Baba Bharati, who I mentioned a couple of times. But um, there also, you know, he, there were other... Um, publications out there that he could read and synthesize. And I think that, you know, the the, the Gita was out there in, in English at that time. Uh, and in fact, he published one under the Ramachakaraka name, uh, a, a translation of, of the Bhagavad Gita uh, later on. But uh, so Atkinson was bringing forth to the American pub public all kinds of, of esoteric stuff. But he was also a new thought writer. And he wrote and studied a lot of mental science and new thought things. And uh, so his magazines would have these articles by different names. Uh, he wrote under the name of Swami Bhakti Vishita. He wrote under the name Swami Pranta, I'm sorry, Panchardasi. <laughs> he wrote under as a as an, a Frenchman, a supposed Frenchman called Theron Q. Dermot. He wrote one book under the interesting name of Magnus Incognito <laughs> that happened to be a book about Rosicrucianism. <laughs> wow. And, and, and he wrote under his own name. That's, and, and, that's and quite all, a cool name. <laughs> yeah. In all total, he has about 100 books out there, and they're all in the public domain. And people can go and find them, you know, for free. But there's also low-cost editions they can find. But he's, but he's an interesting writer. And um, 
what are the things that you, you might say, why did he write under all these different names? There were, there's a number of reasons. One, when he was publishing his magazine, it made it look like multiple people were writing the magazine and not just him. And then he would take the, the series of articles that he wrote, he would and put them into a book that he that would publish by himself. He would take the articles that were written by Yogi Ramachakarika and put them into a book. And then by some of these other names as well. So he would write under these names for his magazines and then aggregate the, the articles by those people, those people, into books by these other names. And he had a theme or topics. Every person who wrote had sort of an an essence. So the Eastern philosophy and Hinduism were the Yogi Ramachakarika books. But he also wrote, you know, a lot of self-help and positive thinking and new psychology books that he published under his own name as Atkinson or under other names. And um, and the books by that he when he became, became a Frenchman, be, pretended to be a Frenchman, those were generally business oriented books. They were books that were using the concepts of new thought and the mental sciences to teach business concepts to people. And he wrote them under this Frenchman's name. So you've got a hundred books. You know, many of them were co-authored with other. With a lot of them were cover, co-authored with other books. And his he was a synthesizer of so much knowledge and wisdom, and and is 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 often considered one of the proponents of, of really bringing Eastern philosophy to the U.S. through his writings as this yogi. So you know. And, and when you read these, they are exercises in breathing and physical concepts and things of that nature, but they're also changing your thinking. They're, they're, they're uh, flavored with the concepts of new thought and, and how to change your thinking and, and change your life. So Atkinson is somebody that people ought to know about. And there's a really wonderful Wikipedia page about him. Uh, I also would recommend, you know, I've got so, a lot of resources on my Conscious Bridge website. Uh, people can go there and if they go to the, the yeah. link for, uh, new thought Re for resources the resource library uh if they go to new thought yeah they I can put that follow, here. yeah uh and just if if they go to the, the page on new thought uh they'll find a link for authors and they'll find follow, follow the links and you'll find a page on william walker atkinson and there's links to, to tons of free uh downloads of pdfs and and uh, uh kindle versions of most of his books that you can download for free and and background information and links to Mitch Horowitz's videos and uh, and other things are on my website. But the Wikipedia page, Wikipedia's name, and that's a good start for you right here. Wow, thank oh you. My what, word. What, I overwhelmed you. <laughs> no, it was wonderful. <coughs> oh, it's intriguing yes. how he tuned yeah, yeah. into um, So you go, uh, Reverend Kathy. I just was going to say that I'm so grateful to learn about him. And I just love his Eastern philosophy that he's bringing in because, you know, that was very influential for Ernest Holmes. You know, you know towards the end of his life, he was studying Sri Aurobindo. And I mean, just kind of fascinating that he took mm -hmm. on this persona of an Eastern yogi. And yeah. during the time, you know, I mean, Paramahansa Yogananda came to the United States in 1920. And so they just celebrated the 100th anniversary of Yogananda. And at the uh, Parliament of the World's Religions, there was a famous yogi. I think it was Vivekananda. Right. In 1893. Yeah. Many, many right. thought that Atkinson and he met, although there's no evidence of that. Okay, I was wondering actually that too, but but it's just he must have so embodied this teaching, you know, that he could, you know, speak to it and write to it, and you know, become become it in a way. Yes, yes, and 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 bring it out so that people think that he really is who he is in terms of these alternate uh, personas. Uh, you know, uh, one of the things when you when you start reading about him, you, you start wondering, well, who else knew about him? You know, and obviously he was really in the mix back in the new early New Thought uh, influences. Uh, Charles Braden in his uh, famous uh, history of New Thought that he wrote back in, in the 1960s. He he references uh, Atkinson only a couple of times. And one of those times is to mention that Atkinson was a major influence on Fenwick, Fenwick Holmes, of course, Ernest Holmes brother. So Ernest obviously knew about Atkinson, and uh, and you talk about uh, right. Holmes uh, bringing you're reading the Life Divine in Aurobindo late in life. You know one of the things if you go back and read the uh, uh, you know, the, the the 
George Bindle's uh, bringing forth those the transcripts of Holmes from his his uh, later years. There's the I think the recently were republished as the Holmes Papers, and you know, but they were you know the the uh, under that they it was Holmes talking to various groups in the 1950s and in the in the latter stages of Holmes' teachings, and one of those things is a history of New Thought, and when you do when you read that history. There is a reference in there. He, he, for several paragraphs, he talks about the Hermetic teachings and and uh, Hermes and the ancient Egypt influences, which I had never heard before until I was rereading re that. That and so not only was was Aurobindo because I'd heard that a lot, you know, about Aurobindo and his influence on Holmes, but I always sort of wondered, well, did what did Holmes think in terms of going back to some of the the Hermetic teachings of ancient Egypt, and he references those as a key uh, aspect of the, um, of the of, of aspects of the teachings of science of mind, and that really links us to to the book, the Kabbalion, that uh, that, that Walker wrote. And um, what I, what I might um, you know just mention is that he um, he published this book in 1908. But it's often cited as one of the biggest influences on occult and uh, metaphysical teachings throughout the 20th century. It's only in, through research in the in the last 20 years has it really been nailed down definitively that Atkinson wrote this book. <laughs> and, I was wondering, actually. Yeah, yeah and and if you uh, there's a there's a historian who writes yeah. a wonderful introduction to this definitive edition of the Kabbalion. And uh, Philippe uh, Deslipe is how I'm saying it, but uh, it's probably pronounced some other way. But he writes a wonderful uh, background article, not only about Atkinson, but about how the evidence that Atkinson wrote the Kabbalion, uh, including you know the fact that uh, Atkinson wrote his own who's who of uh, in America, uh, writing one year and submitted it as a book he had written, and that the French edition of the Kabbalion cites uh, Atkinson as the author. But because for many years it was written in, in a, and is published under the name Three Initiates, people were often wondering who are these three initiates and what and, and who are they? Who are they? Yeah, who are they? And and I think Deslipay in, in his intro makes a, a definitive case for linking Atkinson uh, to to the book The Kabbalion. So um, let me talk a bit about the Kabbalion. Uh, the Kabbalion so could I, is- Could I just say, yeah. I'd like to just say one thing before you, because I know you're going to go and it's going to be- I'm, I'm, well I'm just feeling <laughs> the gratitude for you bringing this forwards because he was, he was very creative to be thinking, right, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to write for one audience and I'm going to write in a different way from an, for another audience, and yet it may all be all one and the same audience, but he was, he was using new thoughts. Actually, he was using new thought in the way that he was authoring um, the principles in these different ways by, um, by reaching different people in different ways with his message. It's ingenious, I think. It really is, and it, it was a product the of the time too. Uh, that they were really, you know, you, you wrote the, you tried to meet the audience where the audience were, and and the very nature that you would say, well, what's going to lend some credence and authority to this if I'm going to write on Eastern religion? Well, it's a yogi, obviously, and I've got to be this Eastern person who's writing this, and you know, it's it's uh, it's a common uh, thing to try to you know bring some sort of a uh, credence and, and 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 background story that gives some value so people will, will hook into it a little more and, and it was very wise on his part and he's using he's using the concepts to, to also bring it bring it about and to, and and he tells people even in his writings try them out if you don't like them discard them and chess something else and probably if you chess something else it's going to be another one of his books under another name his <laughs> one of his <laughs> that's funny yeah, yeah you, I Go ahead. Amazing. Yeah, I had the honor of taking Dr. Tom Sanders' class. He took um, the extension study course to the Science of Mind by Ernest Holmes, and he did all 48 weeks of it. And he absolutely referenced the Kabbalion, too. And I, it was, that was the first time I'd ever heard of it. And so to hear it come back again today with you and, and learning more about William Walker Atkinson is just really fascinating. And so, uh, again, it's... Um, 
it's definitely part of new thought and part of our, our philosophies. So it's yeah. Sweet. You know, and Kathy, I had never really uh, thought too much about uh, um, the, the whole uh, uh, aspect of, of going back to uh, teachings of ancient Egypt and Hermes, uh, you know, as being an aspect of science of mind, because it's not something that's often mentioned or taught in any of our stuff. And, you know, and so to, to read this book and then to go back and read Holmes talking about the hermetic teachings and their influence on him, it actually, it, it sort of, for me, gave credence to the fact that Holmes, Holmes was obviously well aware of, of the Kabbalion and the concepts of hermetic teachings. So I guess I should say, what, what are we talking about with hermetic teachings? Let me just mention a, a note on that. The, the, the aspect or the, uh, is that in ancient Egypt, before the modern times, there was a um, wisdom traditions that were passed down orally. Uh, depending upon who you hear or talk to about them, these could go back for you know the time of Moses, or you know they were influential to many of the, the people who were uh, in the Old Testament of the Bible. But they were they were wisdom t teachings that were handed down and attributed to an Egyptian god called Thoth, and but never actually written down. And of course, if you, if for those of you to, as a quick refresher on Egyptian history, in the latter ages of Egypt, the Greeks and Alexander came in and took over, and they started taking the traditions of Egypt and writing them down. So you had the Hellenistic Greeks coming in, and for the first time, taking the oral traditions of the ancient Egypt teachings and putting them in writing. Well, the Greeks had a god named Hermes. And they noticed that the writings that they were attributing to the Egyptian Thoth related very much to what was coming from the god Hermes. And so when they wrote down the and, and transcribed the oral traditions, they attributed the Egyptian to somebody called Hermes Trismestigus, Hermes Trismestigus, which for many, many years was seen to be a name of a person. But the name actually means twice great or three times as great as Hermes. That's what the name means. And so what many people and scholars now tend to believe is that the, the writings that the Greeks transcribed of the ancient Egypts were signed not to a person named Hermes Trismestigus, but the Greeks were trying to say that the writings and wisdom contained were three times as great as their own god Hermes. These writings were then put, put in, into books that were you know comparable to the time period of many of the early books of the of the Bible, or the books of the Gnostics, and in fact, in some of the recent Gnostic uh, book uh, scroll findings, there were books that came from uh, that, that relate to the uh, her Hermetic uh, traditions. So, this is where it actually comes from, and 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 then the books went underground during the Middle Ages. They were found uh, during the Renaissance, and in fact, uh, one of the famous patrons, Medici and Florence, uh, uh, Italy, uh, had his translators transcribing one of the uh, these uh, ancient books, and, and and they were started studying them. And that's where many of the uh, of the books of, of the Hermetic tradition were were first rediscovered. You know, after the after the Dark Ages, and there's another uh, um, and these books are you know they're, they're called the Hermeticum or the Hermetica, and they're also called the Corpus Hermetica. Which is a list of the book of the books. And there's another document called the the um, the Emerald Tablet, a very short document. And these all, in aggregate, contain what are seen these is these ancient teachings from from Egypt. And um, so these fast forward, you got William Atkinson who then decides to write a book called the Kabbalion, where he's going to summarize the ancient Egyptian teachings into principles. And how how does he do that? Well, the first thing he does is he doesn't put his name on the book. He pretends he's writing as three initiates who are bringing forth the teachings of the Hermetic tradition from ancient Egypt that they are, he references and uses as a literary device the reference of another book that he quotes from in this book. The ancient book that he quotes from is called the Kabbalion. The Kabbalion doesn't mean anything. It's a made-up word. You know, many people think it's sort of like is a is reference to the the Kabbalah tree of life from from the uh, mystic teachings of of uh, Judaism, 
but it's a made up word. And, and, and he, what it references though, is when you read this book, is it's talking about a book, an ancient book called the Kabbalion that it quotes. And so you've got three initiates writing a modern day book that references science and stuff like that, but reference, but also talking and quoting an old fictitious book called the Kabbalion, which is supposed to be hundreds or thousands of years old that summarizes the, the, the uh, the hermetic teachings from ancient Egypt from thousands of years ago. So you hear that story and it sounds like so much, you know, BS that you want right. to discount this <laughs> right off the bat. Right. It's a bunch of, it's just, it's, it, but it's all right. literary devices. It's all literary devices to bring forth what actually are the, the some of the best summaries of the her the her uh, hermetic. hermetic teachings ever that ever presented. In fact, most people now use this book as the source book for going back to, to getting the hermetic teachings because it summarizes it so well. Um, and in fact, recently, uh, Mitch Horowitz in his in his analysis of it, he went back and and I've been reading the Corpus Hermeticum, and I would have to concur with with uh, him that that most of the concepts that Atkinson put down in the Kabbalion are actual good summaries of concepts that were not summarized quite as well in, in the in those hermetic teachings that were brought forth from the the transcription of the, of the oral traditions that the uh, Greeks did back in you know, 2000 years ago. So uh, what he's done is, is get, do a service of summarizing those concepts for us. So what are those concepts would be your next question. So I'll I'll hold I'll pause there, but that's the next one. That's where I'm going. <laughs> wow, this is it's it's like a it's a mystery. Is the whole thing is like a, a kind of mystery literary tale that he's he's taking us on on a on a journey. He's taking us on a journey, um, not only through his writing but also through the way that he's creating. It's like a theater. He's creating yep. this atmosphere of. Of, of authors right. and names and mystical kind of meanings that he's given to things um, mm. like a facade. And yet mm -hmm. the truth is that it's like it's a facade. The truth is, is there within the pages. It's yeah. beautiful. I love it. I'm, it's so <laughs> he's, exciting. He's making, <laughs> myth while he's, he's making a whole myth around this book, <laughs> you know, that it's written by yes. these three people when it's only one person. It, that it's all about a, a book that didn't exist, which he's fully quotes from off and on in here. And but but the but the kernels of the wisdom that are in the book is what's really important. And that's right. where I think that's why I encourage people to read this because it gets into the key principles that he outlines and you go, wow, this makes so much sense. And it puts other things in perspective. And that's why when when uh, when I think that Holmes in his later years says you know, that one of the key influences on science of mind was the hermetic teachings. He's referencing the same concepts that are in this book and summarized by William Walker Atkinson. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, yeah. And so I, I know we don't have a whole lot of time to go through all the concepts, but I, I, I do want to just mention uh, them, them briefly. There, there's He outlines in this book um, seven, what he calls principles. And each one he then elaborates on. And I'll just cover these real quickly. Um, the first one is the principle of mentalism. The principle of mentalism. And what does that mean? Everything is mind. All is mind. That we live in a universe of mind. And so that's one of the key teachings of science of mind, is that all is mind. You know, he begins by talking about what he calls the all. He even uses, interestingly enough, the phrase, this is in 1908 in this book, the thing itself to reference the all. And most of us who are students of science of mind know that's how Holmes writes about God or spirit or the all as the thing itself. And then it, when it, so when I see Atkinson writing that, you know, uh, you know, 15, 20 years before Holmes, it's, it's interesting that it, somehow or another there had to be, you know, some some crossover of, of thoughts or processes here. The thing itself or the all is everything that is. So when we talk about the, the, the inclusion of all that is in the world, you know, the oneness of all that is, that's what the all is. But, but Atkinson writes that this first principle of mentalism is that the all is mind, that everything is mind. 
And then once we get that on, it's not just stuff out there, it is mind. And, and we have to lock into that as the very first beginning aspect of, of the concepts. The second concept is what is called the principle of correspondence. We know this uh, too from, from science of mind and others, but it's when we hear it often and know it as, as above, so below, so below as above. Well, this is one of the hermetic uh, teachings. That is that there are, um, there's realms of being, you know, that there is the realm of spirit and there's the realm of form. And in fact, uh, what Atkinson puts out in here is that, uh, that there's actually multiple, we have to, we have to look at the world as not, not only is everything mind, but there's the world of spirit, there's the world of mind, and then there's the world of form or matter. And that the, the, uh, so the correspondences are between these realms. And so we know it when we talk about the fact that if you change your thinking in the realm of mind, you're going to change your effects in the world of form. But we're also in back, you know, but it works backwards as well, is that things in the world of form, as we often know, can get so mesmerizing to us that they change our thoughts, that our thoughts often correspond to what's going on in the world of, of, of the form in front of us. But that also there's a correspondence to the world of spirit. And so, so that in the spiritual world, there is the perfect ideals, which can be manifest into our thoughts, which can then bring bound in form. So there's this whole flow between the law of correspondence and the various realms of who we're being. That's the second point of the Kabbalion. The third is that uh, there's what he calls the principle of vibration, that everything is vibrating, all is vibrating. And in fact, if we use the sliding scale of spirit down to ma a matter, this is the simply different, it's in degree of vibration. The things are vibrating at a very high frequency, higher up, very low frequency at the lowest essence. And in fact, he says that the very highest nature of spirit Things are vibrating so fast, they seem to be at a standstill. And at the lowest nature of the lowest forms, they seem to be vibrating so slowly, they seem to be at a standstill. But then everything in between is vibrating at different levels. And so that, and then that gets into mental vibrations as well and the, and the, and the attraction, the law of attraction and as, as part of mental vibration. The fourth principle in the book is the principle of polarity and that everything is, in, is uh, uh, on poles that everything that appears to be an opposite is is simply our false way of, of of not looking and seeing the connection between things so that good when we talk about good and bad it's not there's not just a, essential good and essential bad that everything is in a degree between good and bad between hot and cold between between spirit and form that there is a, a gradients of degrees we tend to think i'm flipping off i'm flipping out of form and into spirit no we're moving up a gradient in in, in vibration and to more into the mind, you know, the, the realm of emotions and mind and then into spirit. So, uh, so that's the, the, the rhythm of, of, uh, of uh, polarity. I'm sorry, the principle of polarity. And then the, the, uh, the fifth one is the principle of rhythm, that everything is moving back and forth, that there is a flow back and forth and that we can see this rhythm. And so then what we want to do is, is to know that naturally all of life is a rhythm going from one flow and one side. And we can see that in our lives, you know, good things are happening, bad things are happening, you know, we're in a pandemic, we're not in a pandemic, we're in the answer, so we're in that. And, you know, so, and, and the thing is that what we want to do is to use the other principles, the principle of knowing that everything is mind and that there's a law of correspondence to say, okay, I can mitigate, things are going to move, but I can mitigate my reaction to it and control it more by using my thoughts. And the more I can control my thoughts, the more and, and the more I can then mitigate the negativity that I see when the ri natural rhythms of life move. So I tend to now move it or in a dance in the flow of life rather than letting life, you know, drag me from one place to another. I'm in a, I'm in a dance and, you know, and if I can get in that flow and in that rhythm, then I'm more uh, joyous in, in the expression of life. The, the, the next principle in the Kabbalion is the principle of cause and effect, that everything that, ha that is seen as an effect has some cause somewhere. And that that cause gets into the concepts that we're familiar with in New Thought, that um, causes can be either primary causes in consciousness or they can be secondary causes of form hitting form and making things happen. But what we want to recognize that everything that we experience, either in our own awareness or in the world of form, had, an, had a cause somewhere. 
and for us to be able to track it back. Those causes can be either other secondary causes in the world of form, or we can use recognize the law of correspondence to see that the thoughts at some point, a thought somewhere created the initial form that led to the sequence of things that appear to be form hitting, form hitting, form. So that's the in the essential uh, part of the law of cause and effect. And the final and seventh principle in the Kabbalion is uh, is the principle of gender. Everything has sex. Everything has a creative aspect to it. And it's only and and, and get back to that sliding scale of spirit, mind, body. In the full realm of body and matter, we tend to think of gender as sex, sexual acts, sexual union, etc. But sex is only the physical out picturing of the gender. Gender is a process of creation. And this gets back to why we often in Science of Mind talk about the fact that conscious awareness is, is, is masculine and then the, the law is feminine, because that's what they're really getting at is that there is a there is within everything at every level gender with creative ability. And gender reflects itself in the creative spark of the idea for creation, the word, and the aspect or the law that acts on the word to manifest the, the creation. So, so the law of gender is really about mastering the understanding that everything in life has the masculine and feminine genders, the ability to create the impetus for the new thought, the new creation, and the and the process by which it manifests the the law that all of that is manifest in, in everything that is and the more that we can manifest and see that we can tap into this creative uh, law of gender the more than we can be use all of these principles in in concert to uh, be what uh, atkinson called the the law of mental alchemy you know alchemy was often seen you know by the many as you're going to turn gold in, you know uh, uh base metals into gold mm -hmm. It was all yeah. about the, the, the physical life. But the true part of, of, of trans uh, mutation is transmuting our thoughts mm. to transmute our physical life. And that's right. what mental yeah. alchemy really is. All right. So that's a quick, quick summary of, of his point. Wow. <laughs> so now everybody needs to go read the Kabbalion. Yes. <laughs> We have homework. I like that. Wow. Yes. <laughs> it's, it's available for free in the public. And I love domain. how. You can get an ebook or you can go buy a, buy a real good book of it. I, I love how um, the, the way that he has um, outlined these seven principles. And they're so, they're so aligned to science of mind. I mean, totally. they really are. It's just that they're. Yeah. They are, aren't they, Reverend Kathy? It's just that he, it, I feel as if he's picked out different, he's kind of cherry picked different areas, um, mm -hmm. maybe than at homes in, in the principles of science of mind and the core concepts of, of, of science of mind, which, which I can see how they are so aligned and yet they're different. And it gives me a different way of, of piecing it, of piecing this together. It's like he's unpicked it and put it back in a different way. It's really yeah, interesting. I, I really am I'm with you on that, Laura. It's, it's for me, I said, oh my God, this is making so much more sense of home. It's making me go deeper with her and understanding Ernest Holmes and other new thought writers because of the way Atkinson, and I think probably his, his legal skill and the ability to, to analyze stuff and boil it down in, in such nice, easy language. And, and put the concepts in such a way that you can go, wow, that makes so much sense. And then it also relates back to stuff you've learned and studied in other in, in other aspects of new thought or science of mind. And you go, that makes, now I'm seeing what, what Holmes was talking about there at a different level than I did before. No, I love that. And it, it seems yes. like that it really talks about oneness. Everything begins and ends in unity and oneness. Yes. Yes. Yeah. And, and, and it peppered through this, and I didn't stop to read some of them, are little quotes from the fictitious ancient book, the Kabbalion, because uh, throughout the Kabbalion is, are quotes from the fake book, 
the Kabbalion, which is supposed the to be the one book. Yeah. And I just give you a couple a couple of quickies here. Uh, here's talking about polarity. Uh, it quotes the old Kabbalion is saying everything is dual. Everything has poles. Everything has its pair of opposites. Like and unlike are the same. Opposites are identical in nature, but different in degree. Extremes meet. All truths are but have truths. All paradoxes may be reconciled. And it's it, and when we start reflecting upon these things, we start thinking, because we walk around in, in life and thinking, this is separate from this and this. They're, they're separate and apart. They're opposites, you know. And we tend to make this is like build a wall be, between them. And the more you reflect on that, anytime you divide something into two, to stop and think about the fact that those two things really are the same thing in different degrees. Yes. And then you start seeing them differently. Oh. Amazing. I did, I created a podcast similar to that today about beginnings, about endings and beginnings, and it, it really is just the same thing. Yeah. Transmuting into a, a different experience. And I love it, this um this principle of rhythm, because in 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 our teaching often there's this um well, it can feel quite weighty, you know, your thing, change your life, and then things don't go as we think they should be going. There's this um thought process that can happen of oh I've got it wrong or I'm not good enough or I'm not getting getting I'm not work properly or I need to be better at um at my own inner, inner um self or my self personal growth that there, there can be a kind of judgment that that is placed upon life seemingly not working properly and I love this principle of rhythm it, he's accepting here that there is this flow that it's it's not going to all, all look the way we think it sh should be looking because this is natural experience that's happening where we have to experience all of it yeah and, oh, and there's a perfection in that flow you know we, we look at the you know we can sit back and look yes. at the tides the movement of the moon and the planets and, and but there's a beautiful dance going on that is just you know, it that is really contributing to this overall flow of life and for us to try to think anything out of life and say, okay, I don't want this part to flow. I want this part to be anchored where I want it to be anchored. Then, you know, we're forcing the river. We're pushing the river in that and we're, and trying to force something that is, is, that is improper. And what we've got to find is, is our rhythm within that and, and flow with it to the degree that we can. Here's how they quote the Kabbalion on uh, rhythm. Everything flows out and in. Everything has its tides. All things rise and fall. The pendulum swing manifests in everything. The measure of the swing to the right is the measure of the swing to the left. Rhythm compensates. Wow, that's beautiful. That's beautiful. It and I know beautiful. you've spoken. It's, it's the Tao Te Ching. <laughs> yeah, it is. It is. Being in the flow, the Tao. Yeah. yeah. And I love what Fiona said. She said, dancing in the hermetic flow of life. Yes, <laughs> I just think that's beautiful. And so if you could summarize, we're getting near the end here and just um, and I know we've spoken to it. You've spoken to it throughout. But how would you say for our listeners here, our audience, how can they utilize this wisdom in their own lives? What would be your your kind of um, guidance? Well, you know, there's a couple of ways we can go with this. I, first, I would encourage people to go and and read more about Atkinson and read Atkinson. Um, I think I think the Kabbalion to me is a great starting place. Uh, and I think that if you read it, you're going to find ways to employ the concepts immediately. Uh, if you're like me or Maturowitz, you re read it and you're going to reread it. And, and you're going to discover there are things in here that make so much sense that you're going to employ them. Uh, but I, I don't want to say that that's the only way. Uh, Atkinson's words and his other things are very well written as well. Um, you go go and, and, you know, maybe start with some of the free books that are out there. Download one of his uh, Yogi Ramachakarika books and, and read through it. Uh, you will find a lot of wisdom in him because his books had different focuses for different needs for different people. Some were, you know, the esoteric some were the, uh, you know, for those who wanted to know more about Eastern religion, some were more in the business world aspect, but go and taste some of his writings and discover him. 
uh, because I think he's well worth reading. He's, he's a very uh, clear write, written author that speaks to us here in the 21st century from writings written over 100 years ago. To that, uh, also then, how can you employ it? Um, you know, one of the things, you know, that I'll, I'll, I'll give a shout out to my, my website again. Uh, back when I read the Kabbalion, and I did a five part uh, blog series on it on my website. And the very last article of, of uh, and if you go to the, the blog site that's on the website now, just search for the Kabbalion and it will bring up all the all the ones that have the Kabbalion in it. And there's about five of them. But there's one where I I offered just five or six tips on how to use the Kabbalion in yes. your day to day life, you know, Wonderful. and 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 one of those we've already talked about. And that's like living, looking at life as a flow and being and moving to be more in the flow of life, you know. But there's there's several other tips that I've I've put on there for using these concepts from this book that you can use, you know, in your individual life. I think a lot of it is a reorientation. I think that all of us are students of uh, of new thought. Uh, the more that we understand a lot of the roots of people who are influential, the more that it deepens our understanding of what we're reading. Yes, we study Holmes or Fillmore or others, uh, and and we study many of the contemporary new thought writers. All have words of wisdom for us. There's such value in going back to so many of these people who were prolific and influential in the founding days of new thought. And I think a lot of their writings can still speak to us in these days. Cool. Thank you. That's beautiful. Profound. Thank you. Yes. Well, thanks for having me on. It was a lot of fun. It's, I know I, I rambled on, oh, but I, was, I got excited. It was perfect. It was perfect. <laughs> But that oh, makes all of us excited. That's too. why you're here, so, the ramble. I know, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> a great ramble. So, well, so I hope everybody have, learned a little bit about Atkinson you. today and, and get encouraged to go check him out. Thank you. And, and do you have any classes or workshops or talks or or that way people could reach out to you and learn more about your, your sacred work. The Science Mind Archives is so blessed to have you on our board of directors. And we have a special committee called our super committee, which looks at our, our collections. What do we have? What do we need to bring in? And how to get it out to the world. And I will give a shout out that Reverend Mark has taken it upon himself to bring out, quote, in air quotes, new Ernest Holmes on the Science Mind Archives website. I mean, he just took it. I mean, we're every we're constantly adding new Ernest Holmes on the ScienceMindArchives.com website, thanks to Reverend Mark. But so, how can folks kind of reach out and learn more about you? Well, they certainly can go to my website, uh, ConsciousBridge.com. There's links there to uh, to obviously all my materials, as well as a link to my YouTube page where I post videos. I've I've been taking some time off for the last month. Uh, but they're going to you're going to see new content coming out there very soon. Uh, as far as classes, I am uh, teaching some classes for Centers for Spiritual Living. Uh, anybody who is just going into Prac One this fall might uh, they can certainly sign up for that class. That's the only one I've got yeah. currently in the works. But um, but I'm looking at some other uh, content, and I'd, I uh, I'm, I'm looking to bring maybe something out about the Kabbalah. And I did a uh, uh, I was leading a session at a men's retreat earlier this year and did a whole thing on, on the teachings of the Kabbalion and applying them in our lives. And that may be something I'm, I'm pushed to do here shortly, because I think that this book is, is a very valuable tool for all of us. Yes. Thank you so much for yes. being here. We sure appreciate it. My you. pleasure. Have me back and maybe we'll talk about Christian Thank D. Lark. <laughs> That'd be fun. That would be amazing. That. Yes, that would be amazing. Thank you so much, Reverend Mark, for being here. And I know that you you are presenting also on the Science of Mind conversations, the textbook conversations here on New Thought Media Network. So um, that's right, including this if you'd Saturday. Like to hear more. <laughs> this Saturday, there we go. So yeah, tune yeah. in this Saturday. <laughs> New Thought Media Network, Mark will be sharing about a certain section of the textbook. And I'm not sure which Teaching section it is. Teachings of the mystic, Mark ironically. Which... Oh. There we go. Teaching Fantastic. Yeah. You're in a mystical week. <laughs> <laughs> and thank you to everybody that's been here um, sharing and commenting. We really value you. 
um, for um, sharing your insights and and supporting and being supporting this program and the network. Of course, we are a global focus ministry, ministering these teachings in so many different and wonderful and exciting ways every single day of the year. Wow, I think even on Christmas Day and and uh, and all um, different religious and spiritual holidays and we are here shining the light to um to empower us to know love basically this is what it is it comes back to knowing who we are as love and so thank you for being here and i'm going to quickly put the donate button up because i always do if you feel called if this feeds you and nourishes you and you love the vision of this ministry then there is the link that you can um can share your love offering conscious give into a new thought media network and support this wonderful vision for the network and thank you reverend kathy again this is such a joy to be with you here absolutely i love being with you too laura we have a good time and we bring out the mystics out to the world we how do. wonderful is that yes so blessings. Thank you, Reverend Mark. Thank you, everyone. And you know, feel free to check out Science of Mind Archive. Thank you, everyone. For all, all the good. And we'll see you next time on Wisdom of the Mystics. Yes, next time. Thank you, Reverend Mark. Thank you. Bye, everyone. <laughs>